speakers today have had a very difficult job. As Lucy points out numerous times, when you get interested in something, you can talk about it for hours. And I think every speaker today has struggled to stay within time limit. Or probably nobody more so than our next speaker. <laughs> I contacted uh, Professor Bailey, who's a professor of physics at UNR, to do a talk for us on Darwin Day this year. And I said, well, I want you to talk about, just talk about the Big Bang, the evolution of the universe, how planets form, how everything we perceive came into being, and I need it under 20 minutes. You know? So I think that may have been a bit too ambitious. So what we're going to get is a really great condensed talk about the evolution of the elements. So, Professor Bailey, please take over. Um, also, to correct things, I'm not a tenured professor, I'm a lecturer, so it's Dr. Bailey. Uh, but anyway, this was the t uh, title slide from a talk I gave to uh, the, the SSA um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and it comes from a book by uh, Richard Krauss called uh, A Universe from Nothing. You can find a YouTube video of the same uh, title, and I would encourage you to watch it if you want more details than what I'm going to rush through here now. A uh, better title would be The Big Bang Theory. First there was nothing, then it exploded. Uh, so, I'm going to run you through some high school physics up to uh, the 1920s so I can uh, give you a background of what we're going to talk about. In 1671, Newton proved that white light, contrary to the accepted theory at the time, was not pure. It was a combination of all the colors. And uh, this led to the whole exploration of what we call optics. And uh, by the 1800s, the chemists were already uh, piecing together what you've seen in classrooms, the periodic table, uh, which consists of things over here on the right, like uh, halogens, and there's carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen at the top, and over on the left side are metals, and in the middle are what we call transition metals. Uh, this was being pieced together before we even knew what an atom was. We knew that there was charged matter in the world. Uh, we could pull electrons off of things. We could isolate protons from humble hydrogen over there on the left uh, top of the chart. Uh, and we figured out that as you added a proton to hydrogen, you got a new element, helium, and add a proton to helium, you get lithium, and on and on and on. Uh, but we still didn't know what an atom was. This was an idea that had come down from the Greeks. But we did understand that there were charged particles in nature. Um, and we were also playing with the states of, of matter. Uh, we knew that if we took a solid and heated it up, you could turn it into a liquid. Heat it up more, you could turn it into a vapor. Um, more so, you could start to ionize it, turn it into a plasma. And uh, plasma is a highly charged entity where electrons have been stripped off of nuclei, uh, but they didn't know this. They didn't know that there were nuclei. They knew that they could create, again, charge separation with particles. And uh, it turns out about 99.9% .9 of the universe is in the plasma state, not solids and liquids as here on planet Earth. Um, they measured the emission of light from hot objects, and they always got this continuous rainbow of colors, and they figured this is how matter emits radiation. All the atoms, whatever they are, must act together and emit light so that you get this continuous rainbow of colors. Well, then a, a Swiss high school teacher got hold of some low-pressure gas discharge lab uh, lamps, and he didn't see these continuous rainbow spectra. He saw what are called discrete line emission spectra. And helium's there at the top, uh, hydrogen below it. Uh, helium constitutes about 24% of the stuff in the universe. Hydrogen about 75% or more. And uh, it turns out that every element had, has its own unique spectra. And this was a clue to the structure of matter. Uh, Max Planck uh, took this idea and came up with the idea that light was emitted in quantized amounts, or he gave it the word photons, or, and that's the quantum of energy, and that's where we get the term quantum mechanics. And then Einstein came along shortly after that. He added his uh, very important contribution to this understanding. But in 1905, he had his Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year, and he published four groundbreaking papers on the photoelectric effect uh, based on Planck's photon concept, Brownian motion, which has to do with the motion of tiny dust particles, which are actually being hit by air molecules, and they didn't know that at the time. Uh, but most importantly, his uh, special relativity and the equivalence of energy and mass e equals mc squared. All of this before the age of 26, while he was a patent clerk in Bern, Switzerland. Um, and anyway, uh, a guy named Ernst Rutherford came along, and how do you close this? Okay, all right. Uh, Ernst Rutherford came along and started shooting this magical particle called an alpha particle, which came from the radioactive decay of some elements, and he was shooting in the gold foils, and he came to the conclusion that all the positive charge, whatever it is inside a, a nucleus, must, inside an atom, must be concentrated in a nucleus. 
And if you were to make a hydrogen atom the size of an NFL football stadium, the nucleus would be a sesame seed on the 50-yard line, and the electrons would be orbiting at the distance of the parking lot, showing that the atom was overall empty space, 99.9% .9 empty space. And the nucleus contained almost all the mass of the atom, all the positive charge. Um, and then another guy, Niels Bohr, came along in 1911 and came up with a simple sort of planetary model of an atom. And, but here's the difference. In the atom, the electrons, like planets, sort of, can only orbit at particular orbits that have particular energies. And that's the origin of the line spectra that we saw here. Those represent discrete energy levels inside an atom. And no two atoms has the same energy levels. No two ions do either, and those are atoms that have had some of their charges removed. So this was a first step, and it made sense. And we were often running in what we call quantum mechanics. This is a compilation of the spectra of all the elements, all crammed together. But a spectroscopist can go in and gather light from a star or a galaxy and read these lines and tell exactly what a galaxy or a star is made of. You can do this with planets and their atmospheres, too. Um, and then Einstein, in 1916, came along with his general theory of relativity. Uh, Newton's law of gravity had been very successful, and it described an action at a distance phenomena where masses, for some magical reason, attracted each other. And Einstein came along and said, he's wrong. It's a nice model. It works in many cases. But what happens is mass actually bends space. And then, and then objects tell other objects how to move through bent space. This is a poor two-dimensional analogy. Uh, this is what it really looks like. This is the gravitational field around the Earth. It's bent space. And this has been verified uh, through many observations on much larger scales than the Earth. In fact, you can't, it's hard to verify on the scale of the Earth. It's easier to do with clusters of galaxies. But Einstein's theory was proven by, through the observation of an eclipse, that, a solar eclipse that happened in uh, 1919, I believe. And in that case, here we go again. All right. There we go. And um, here is the Earth, and you can see the sun and a star that would normally be behind the sun and not viewable from the Earth. But Einstein reasoned that during a solar eclipse, when the disk of the sun is blocked, then light from the distant object would actually be bent by the bent space near the sun and would be pulled into our field of view. And so stars that shouldn't be visible would just be visible because of this warping of space-time. And this uh, space, and he also came as that idea that space and time was a single entity, sort of a fabric that stuff is made out of. Um, this was a, 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 an incredible conclusion. Einstein actually wasn't that impressed with it. Other people were. Uh, but anyway, this is the basic conclusion. Matter tells space how to bend, and space tells light how to move. Light travels in a straight line, but if the space is bent, it will follow the curvature of space. And, but there was a problem. In a, Einstein believed in a static universe. Uh, he, was sort of, he sort of believed the universe was eternal, uh, and if, it, if that was the case, then why wasn't gravity, or why hadn't gravity, already pulled everything together in a giant crashing sound? In order to solve this dilemma, he came up with a cosmological constant, a repulsive fudge factor, if you will, that is holding the universe up against itself. And he later on to say, say with regret that that was the biggest mistake of his life. But had he lived longer, he would have been vindicated. Uh, so these are the giants of quantum mechanics. We started understanding that there's no such thing as a true particle. Particles can act like waves. Waves can act like particles. Over here on the right is Heisenberg, who came up with the uncertainty principle that basically says there are things that can, there are, there are things that might be able to happen, and if that is the case, they must happen. It's very strange, but when you study physics and learn about quantum mechanics, this all starts to make sense. And uh, we do experiments at the undergraduate level where we can show that particles can act like waves and vice versa. So the solid things we count on in our life are not exactly what they, they seem to be. But Einstein was a critic of quantum theory. Uh, I think probably by 20 years after this time, uh, he had accepted it begrudgingly because uh, there was just so much evidence backing it up. But anyway, moving on here. Um, up until 1921, anyone who would have looked at the sky would have thought that that was the universe. That's a picture of the Milky Way, and we thought that was the universe. And inside the Milky Way, you'll find these uh, nebulas. These are stellar nebulas. Um, this is an emission nebula showing a bunch of young stars that are being born, and uh, that made sense. But then there were these other ones, these funny spiral nebulas. And astronomers looking at them had the, the sneaking suspicion that they were actually much more distant objects. But how would you prove that? 
Well, a guy named Hubble came along, here we go, and uh, just to review something, there's something called the Doppler shift you might have heard of. Uh, you might have received the traffic ticket based on it. Uh, if you have a moving object and it's moving towards you or away from you, its frequency and its wavelength will be changed by the relative motion of the source and the observer. So when you hear a car approaching you and then going past you, you hear it go, and that's because the sound of the engine, which is actually steady, changes because first the car is approaching you, that compresses the waves in your direction, and then as it goes away from you, it stretches the waves out. And when the waves are stretched out, we call that a red shift when talking about visible light, because red light is the longest wavelength, and if an object is coming towards you, it's blue shifted, and that's uh, blue is the shortest wavelength. So these are the terms we use. So Edwin Hubble, Hubble got hold of uh, access to a big telescope, and he started looking at these spiral nebulas and measuring Doppler shifts and comparing them with stars that you could see in the Milky Way. And he found out that they had radically different speeds. And he found that there was a relationship between the um, red shift and the speed of recession of these objects. And what's more important, here we go, um, you can measure a wavelength for a stationary source in the lab, and then you can measure the same wavelength of light emitted by a star or a galaxy that's moving away from you or towards you, and that's a reflection of the speed with which the object is moving away or towards you. And we call this the recession velocity because, as Hubble found, nearly every object that he looked at appeared to be receding from the Milky Way, from the Earth. Only a few nearby galaxies that belong to our local group were actually moving towards us. But everything else was moving away. How could that be? Well, and here's an example showing a normal spectrum of hydrogen or some element over here on the left, and this and the um, similar spectrum taken from a galaxy showing the shift of the lines, and that allows you to calculate the speed of this object that is moving away from you. And if there's a God, he has a great ironic sense of humor because one of the people who really gave us this idea of the Big Bang was a Catholic priest named Georges Lemaitre. Uh, he had been an artillery calculator in World War I, was horrified by what he had been through, uh, turned to the priesthood, but he was a brilliant <coughs> mathematician. And he was playing with Einstein's own uh, general theory of relativity and then looked at Hubble's results and said, you know, if you run this clock backwards, if everything's expanding now, you run it backwards, the universe must have been at a single concentrated point or even a primordial atom at some point before it exploded. And so he basically said, you don't need a cosmological constant. The flinging outward force of the Big Bang will keep things from crashing together due to gravity. And that's when Einstein went, oh boy, did I make a mistake. Uh, I didn't need this fudge factor. And one thing you don't do in science is invent fudge factors. Uh, you have to find the science to explain it. So it's expansion that keeps the universe from collapsing due to gravity. <clears throat> Okay, so this is kind of what an expanding universe looks like. The galaxies aren't expanding, they're embedded in this matrix of space-time, and that's what's expanding, carrying the galaxies with it. And one of the weird things about, not weird things, one of uh, Einstein's special uh, postulates of special relativity says that no object can travel faster than the speed of light, but that does not put any restrictions on the expansion of space-time, because it is not a, an object that contains mass. It's the matrix in which everything exists. And this is kind of what the expansion would look like from any vantage point anywhere in the universe. Everyone sees basically the same effect from their vantage point. And uh, here's a picture you might find on the internet showing um, the universe exploding into some blackness. But that's not right because space-time was created in the Big Bang too. So this is a proper picture of what happened moments after the Big Bang. Space and time were created along with the matter and the energy and there was nothing out there waiting to accept it. And uh, so, um, when this idea first started being fleshed out around World War II, and especially afterwards, one of his detractors, uh, astronomer Fred Hoyle, said, so what, the universe began with a big bang? And they went, yeah, okay, yeah, that works. Um, and uh, he went on to criticize me more and said, the reason why scientists accept this big bang is because they are overshadowed by the book of Genesis. Uh, it is deep within the psyche of most scientists to believe in the first page of Genesis. Wrong. Uh, that's not what drives scientists. And why don't we see the curvature of space today? Well, here's, here's what the universe might have looked at looked like when it was a few seconds old. But it rapidly expanded, so by the time you get to the present day, you're, the curvature lines are simply not obvious. In fact, space is quite flat, as we say. Imagine you put an ant on a desktop globe and then suddenly expanded that globe to the size of the Earth. What would the ant perceive? That he was on a flat surface. So, we, can be, we have to get into a three-dimensional mode of thinking about geomet this geometry of space-time to make sense of it. 
And interestingly, in the 1930s, there was a scientist named Fritz Zwicky, and he was looking at clusters of galaxies, and he could measure, using this Doppler effect, he could not only measure their recession velocity, but their velocity with respect to each other. And he found that these uh, galaxies were moving so fast that according to gravity, they should have escaped each other, but yet they were still together in a cluster. The conclusion he came to was that there's more matter there than you can see, and, and he coined the term dark matter. And he said, there's just a problem. These galaxies are moving too fast. He had no way to measure this, but this is, what, this is when the idea was born, that there was more stuff out there than what we can see. We can only see stuff that emits light or affects other objects around it through the forces that are known, and uh, that just wasn't available at the time. Uh, this is showing some red shifts. I'll go past this. Now, this is the Hubble diagram. You plot the recession velocity in kilometers per second versus either the distance or photographic magnitude, the brightness of an object. And the brightness of an object is also a, a, a representation or, uh, of its distance from you. What's interesting is that the slope of this line has units of one over time. And if you take the reciprocal of it, you get the age of the universe in seconds. And that was why measuring the Hubble constant became so important. They realized they could actually find the age of the universe by doing so. On top of it, there was a fellow named George Gamma, Alfer, uh, Ralph Alfer, and uh, Hans Bethe, and Robert Herman also realized that if the universe was initially in a very small, condensed state, it was extremely hot, and that light from that heated state should still be in the universe today, and it should be extremely redshifted, redshifted into the microwave background, the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in 1964, two engineers working for Bell Labs stumbled across microwave noise from a horn that they were experimenting with trying to improve microwave communications. Uh, you're the beneficiary of it today with your cell phones. Uh, but anyway, they tripped over the cosmic microwave background radiation. And in 1933, we finally discovered or verified the existence of a neutron. There had been a problem with that periodic table. We had figured out that uh, atoms appeared to have at least twice as much mass as the number of protons that they had. And this was a glaring enigma. And someone had, many people had hypothesized there was a neutral particle of similar mass, but it didn't have a charge, so it wouldn't react with electrons. Finally, an experiment was done in 1933 and proved the neutron's existence. Within a couple years after that, Hahn and Strassman figured out that you could split an atom, and we were off and running to making nuclear bombs. First fission bomb was made in 1945, and it was a hop, skip, and a jump to make the first hydrogen bomb uh, over here about uh, less than 10 years later. And we make a hydrogen bomb blow up by fusing elements together, hydrogen, uh, isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. And stars do this because they have immense mass, and they actually do it by a different uh, method. But anyway, this is how you can uh, make heavier elements out of lighter elements, and the product generally being helium and a few other elements. Um, but there was a problem, and when they looked at the stellar abundance of, or they looked at the abundance of helium, as I said before, it was about 24% versus 75% hydrogen, what they started to understand about stars via their research on hydrogen bombs was that the universe should only have about 5%, or not even quite 5% helium. Where did all this helium come from? And they realized it was primordial. It was created during the Big Bang. And as we started to fill in the steps in this process, we understood why. And I want to get to that very quick. Um, isotopes are things that have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. And there's been some discussion today about carbon-14 and other things. Uh, but anyway, we now know, and we learned, especially again from our nuclear weapons and studying stars, that it's the massive stars that synthesize the heavier elements. The, the famous astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson was asked one time what was the most profound thing that he had learned in science. And he said it is that our, the atoms in our body were synthesized in the crucible of massive stars, generations of massive stars that exploded and spewed their nuclear enriched guts into the cosmos to be taken up by new clouds of hydrogen and helium from which planets and, others, and new stars would form. And this is showing a supernova remnant of a star that has ripped itself to pieces and very often it leaves something in a remnant called a neutron star, uh, but that's for another topic. And you've taught, we've heard about radioactive decay today. We can actually date the, we can date these supernovas by looking at the freshly minted um, radioactive elements that are created during these supernova explosions. Uh, we can use our telescopes like time machines and actually measure the, the age of these things. And a lot of these objects are just a few thousand years old or 10,000 years old. And we see that everything is consistent with what we know about radioactive decay here on Earth. And we've learned a lot from meteorites, and that was brought up before, too. So let me look past this. 
So what we know from this Big Bang scenario is that the early universe, here we are at one second, was very hot. And when it was very hot, it, the only particles that could form at first were electrons and positrons. Um, they were zipping around. Uh, they could be created by gamma rays, but when they touch each other, it's matter touching antimatter. They annihilate each other. These gamma rays kept the universe hot. Uh, in the meantime, as it started to cool, the quarks, if you've heard of those, those are the components of, of protons and neutrons, they started to come together and form the first nuclei. But this process got shut off very quickly because this universe is expanding and cooling very rapidly. And nuclear reactions require a certain temperature and density in order to occur. And if you drop that temperature and drop the density, you cut the reaction off. So the universe got cut off before it could synthesize anything more massive than lithium. That's the third element on the periodic chart. And so this tells us that everything that was Everything you're made out of, everything this planet is made out of, came later. And it had to wait for the first generations of massive stars that could synthesize these nuclear elements and then blow up and enrich the cosmological uh, soup, if you will, for, so that more synthesis could occur and we could get a gradual enrichment of these elements. So the iron and the hemoglobin in the blood in your left hand probably came from a different star than the iron uh, in the hemoglobin in your right hand. And your calcium atoms, all the atoms except the hydrogen atoms in your body, used to reside in the core of a star. You are quite literally stardust, or for the hippies, star children. Um, but anyway, so uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the problem. In the early universe, you could only synthesize up to helium-4, and then there was this big energy gap and a real cutoff trying to get heavier than that. And this is one of the successes of the Big Bang Theory, is that it predicts the elemental abundances of these things in the early universe. So moving on again, uh, we learned today, uh, and continue to add to this picture, this is the Large Hadron Collider in uh, Switzerland, where we do incredibly high energy collisions, uh, energies that are as big as those that were present in the early universe after a fraction of a second after the Big Bang began. And uh, we have filled in, as this is called the standard model of particles and how they interact. And you might have heard a couple years ago, we verified the existence of the Higgs boson. This is the thing that gives mass to different particles. This had been predicted 35 years before its discovery. It's a very powerful theory. If you make a, a prediction that long ago and you finally build a machine and it comes in right on cue, but it's incomplete. It doesn't include dark matter and dark energy. And that's going to require another talk, but one of the most important things is the measurement of this, this cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, this is a, these are hot and cold spots, blue, cold, yet red, hot. And we're talking about tiny fluctuations of one ten thousandth of a degree Kelvin between the hot spots and the cold spots. And this tells us about the density of the young universe, and this is also consistent with the idea that the universe could only have synthesized uh, helium and, and a little bit of lithium in, when it first began, that everything else would have to wait. So that thing that we see, though, that is not the moment of creation. That's the moment when the universe became transparent. Prior to that, when the universe was very hot and dense, you had hot nuclei and electrons and photons bouncing off of each other, and basically the light was trapped inside of matter. But once the universe cooled enough so that the nuclei could grab the electrons and join with them and become atoms, that's when the universe became transparent. And that happened about 400,000 years after the Big Bang started. And that's what we can see in that cosmic background radiation. So let me move ahead here further to, that's talking about redshift. Here we are. The, it would be best not to call it a Big Bang, but the sudden expansion from a quantum state we may never understand. Uh, that we're, we may never be able to build an accelerator more powerful, uh, powerful enough to answer that question. But up here, what happens up here, these are within the energies of modern particle accelerators. And that can take us back to a billionth of a, a tenth of a billionth of a second after the whole show got started. Um, I did my PhD dissertation up here in the low energy region of dentist x-rays and uh, um, plasma sources and things like that. But this is that surface that we get to see right here. This is that, <coughs> the first, uh, the decoupling of matter and the escape of radiation from the hot soup. And then one step further here, type 1a supernovas are a very important type of supernova. I may have to wait to discuss that later. But these are very important. Uh, astronomers call these guys carbon bombs. They're a special type of supernova, a low mass supernova, that creates a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And then when it blows up, it 
totally self-destructs and liberates all that material. So we think we have evidence that one of those blew up in our neck of the woods about 4.6 billion years ago and initiated the collapse of our sun because we live in a carbon-rich uh, solar system. And stars like that, like I said, can easily make the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So, um, and if we look out in space and listen in radio waves, we can see very familiar organic molecules forming in interstellar clouds of gas and dust from which planets and future stars will form. And these are very common to any organic <coughs> chemistry. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of the universe. It happens everywhere we look. And then I guess I'll have to cut it quick. I want to get to this point. Yes, we live because stars died. It is quite literally true that we are star stuff in the highest, most exalted way that one can use the phase, the phrase, and uh, phase I wrote. Uh, Carl Sagan said, we are a way the cosmos can know itself. Well, we have eyes on the cosmos, and you probably know something about the Hubble Space Telescope and how far a look back time this gives us. But what's fascinating about the look back time is our telescopes are time machines. When we look to the area around us, our local neighborhood, we see mature galaxies. As we look further back in time, we see galaxies as teenagers. As we look even further back out in time and space, we see very young galaxies in the process of forming. And what we know is that the synthesis of the elements from which you and rocky planets could form weren't there at the beginning. In fact, it took billions of years to synthesize those elements. So if there were, there were first solar systems, but they could have only had gas giants of pure hydrogen and helium, um, like sort of like Jupiter and Saturn, though they do have some organics. Uh, the first rocky planets probably didn't come into being till about seven billion years ago. So the Earth is not a first generation rocky planet. Uh, we're a late comer to this show. And um, there are 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe with 200 to 400 billion stars each more than 10 times the number of grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth. And if you have a bottle of water today, there's about 10 times more atoms in that bottle of water than there are stars in the observable universe. So, it's, it's just, it's, to understand cosmology, you have to learn a lot about the details and wrap your mind around it. But then, when it does hit you, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson calls it being starstruck, where you are just suddenly left in awe and humbled by the majesty of the universe you have epiphanies, and they are accompanied by ecstasies when you come to understand this knowledge. And those are religious terms. And so don't think that scientists are a bunch of sterile uh, guys who don't uh, have any uh, passion or emotion about this. Uh, we are just awestruck by the universe and what we see in it. Um, so I'll have to leave it there. Uh, one more thing here, I'll go past this. Uh, the fate of the universe. I'll, I'll dig into my time here. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, the Big Bang has been in about, let's see, here we go. In about uh, three billion years from now, our big sister galaxy, Andromeda, is going to come eat us. Uh, we're gonna, she's going to cannibalize us, and uh, the collision will take about a billion years to occur. And when it's all done, the sun will be orbiting in the center of a new galaxy that is uh, more than twice the size that it has now. But uh, don't hold your breath. About a billion years after that, the sun, which is down here in the corner today, will swell to a red giant and come right up to the Earth in its orbit and fry it. And uh, it'll shrink back again, and then it'll blow up to a bigger red giant that will engulf Mars. But don't worry, we won't be here anymore. Uh, 150 billion years from now, galaxies beyond the local group, group will emit light so heavily redshifted that it's in the microwave region. We won't see them in our telescopes anymore. Uh, the local group will be one giant meta galaxy. Future humans, unlikely, or any conscious being at the time, will come to the conclusion that they are alone in the universe. They won't be able to see the other galaxies. Space will be expanding so much they'll think they're alone. They will come to the wrong conclusion about how they got there. Two trillion years or so from now, 150 times present age, the redshift of weapons will be larger than the size of the visible universe. So all the emissions that aren't local will be invisible. The universe goes dark. Stars with the lowest masses, the little red dwarfs, live for up to. Um, 30 trillion years, uh, they'll still be around, and it'll result in what's called the heat death of the universe. Even the protons eventually decay, fall apart into photons, and that will happen in only 10,000 trillion, 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 trillion years, or 10 to the 100th years, maybe. Um, the quantum fluctuation we call the universe dissolves back into the nothingness from whence it came. And in Lawrence Krauss's book, you'll find out that there really is no such thing as no thing. The vacuum is seething with energy and virtual particles, and the whole universe might have erupted from some strange state of stuff. And uh, 
to finish with Neil deGrasse Tyson's, the good thing about science is it's true whether you believe it or not. Um, and so I'll have to stop there. I've gone over time, and I can answer I guess, a few questions very quickly. So trillion years in 25 minutes. Uh, so, <laughs> yes? So, so I have that two questions. Two questions. So, in, in line with what Darwin found out about our life and gave us an answer for our existence here, how far, if ever, do you think we will find out a theory of everything through the universe? In other words, is there something out there, like Darwin pointed out just now, we, we can grasp most of us grasp it. In some part of the universe, it says, oh, this is why it works this way, and this is what we're expanding into. Do you think that will happen in the future? I would lean towards Gödel's incompleteness theory, I think it is, that there are some things we will never be able to know. And asking what happened before the Big Bang used to be a nonsensical question. But now we do consider the possibility that there was a time or an existence somewhere, the, a matrix out of which this universe erupted for whatever reason. And it may be something that's ubiquitous in, in other dimensions. So will we ever be able to see those other dimensions is the question. Don't know. Yes. So how has the recent um, proof of gravitational waves impacted this science? Um, very important because in the past, that I, I had some more slides on it, but I couldn't show them. Um, in the past, we could only see the effect by gra uh, of mass and gravity by how it affected the light from stars and galaxies. Now we have a direct probe of the reverberations, the rumbles sent through the space-time fabric directly from these, um, right now, only massive uh, objects like the, the pulse they saw recently came from two uh, orbiting binary black holes that merged. Uh, that's because the interferometer that they use is only four kilometers long per arm. We're going to put a, a, a fleet of satellites into space where there'll be a million miles between each one and it'll be much more sensitive and we'll be able to pick out the rumbles from supernovas and, and ordinary objects. It's going to be amazing. We have new eyes on the cosmos now. We can actually detect gravity directly instead of indirectly. Thanks very much. Okay. So thanks very much, man. Thank you for being so succinct in your talk. <laughs>